Namaste and welcome to the video course on watershed management. Today in module 2 on sustainable watershed approach and watershed management practices in lecture number 5 we will discuss about the agriculture practices and uh, watershed management. So, the topics covered in today's lecture include watershed ecology and the agro ecosystems, soil and water conservation management practices, sustainable land management practices, crop management, nutrients and pest management, integrated farming and finally, a case study. Some of the important keywords in today's lecture include agro ecosystems, agriculture management, nutrient and pest management and integrated farming. So, as we discussed in earlier lectures like sustainable water management or sustainable land management or uh, the sustainability issues are all very important in, in watershed management. So, uh, in, uh, in any of the watershed which we consider one of the important land use is the agriculture. So, we have to see what are the important issues as far as the uh, agricultural management is concerned, what are the important issues in sustainable agriculture management. So, uh, as far as watershed uh, uh, in uh, many parts of the world are uh, concerned, uh, watersheds are experiencing pressure from high population growth, climate, land use change and over exploitations of natural resources. So, you can see the effect of population growth and then the land use change all these uh, are directly influencing the agricultural practices uh, within the watershed. So, as we discussed earlier to stop the degradation of natural resources and to understand the sustainable agriculture management practices, we need to deal with uh, upstream and downstream resources management challenges. So, what are the major challenges within the watershed as far as various resources are concerned, how we deal with the, the, uh, the management of those resources. Then uh, the sustainable agriculture management is concerned, uh, we have to deal with the uh, to identify sustainable land use practices to increase sustainable agriculture production. Uh, and to increase opportunity of rural livelihood. So, you can see that in most of the, uh, the uh, areas, uh, the rural people are living mainly based upon the agricultural or the farm outputs. So, we have to improve this farm output in a sustainable way. So, uh, for that on a watershed basis, we have to see that uh, the agriculture is sustaining and then the, the, the land use is sustainable and water use is sustainable. So, uh, within that we have to see that uh, how we can have better uh, agricultural uh, or agriculture water management or agricultural uh, practices. So, let us see some of the issues as far as uh, water management in agriculture is concerned. So, this uh, deals with the interactions and interplay between food, people and uh, nature sectors. So, we have already seen earlier when we discussed about the sustainability issues. So, the important sectors are food, people and nature. So, out of this the food sector uh, produces a biomass and uh, influence ecosystem uh, most of the time positively and sometimes negatively. So, we can see that uh, as far as uh, agriculture is concerned, um, the uh, water is concerned, uh, major use is uh, consumptive. So, this is uh, uh, can be directly through irrigation or uh, otherwise. So, as far as irrigation is concerned, there can be major or micro irrigation and uh, um, uh, many times farmers use excessive uh, irrigation and uh, say this uh, irrigated water uh, are largely uh, recycled. Then some of the other issues uh, like use of fertilizers and pesticides and then corresponding uh, problems like uh, non-point uh, source of pollution in the water uh, either surface or ground water. So, like this uh, uh, we can see that agricultural uh, water use is concerned uh, a large number of issues are there which we have to deal um, uh, as far as the particular watershed is concerned or watershed management is concerned. So, uh, you can see that uh, when we consider uh, the, the three sectors like food, people and nature. So, the requirement of water for the people is uh, relatively small. Uh, so, uh, you can see that uh, say for example, 
if you can see 1 centimeter per hectare per day for as far as the irrigation water is concerned that much water is sufficient for uh, thousand people uh, domestic or other usages. So, uh, if you consider uh, say uh, the world average as far as agricultural, municipal and industrial water usage is concerned the ratio is 70 to 15 to 15 percent. But uh, say for example, in developing country like India, this usage is uh, 85 percent for agricultural, uh, only 8 percent for municipal use and 7 percent for uh, industrial sector. So, that way you can see that uh, say for example, uh, in a country like India, uh, major portion of the uh, water is used for agricultural purposes. So, if we can save uh, uh, the water available water uh, say by doing appropriate agriculture management practices, uh, effective water use in agriculture, then uh, we can save a uh, lot of water. So, uh, but uh, you can see that in most of the time whenever um, uh, we consider the uh, farming sector for a sustainable agriculture, we need uh, irrigation since as we discussed earlier, uh, the rainfall is uh, um, say um, distributed only for say 4 or 5 months. So, time wise variation is there, then spatial wise variation is there. So, that way we need um, irrigation for sustainable uh, agriculture. Uh, so, uh, that way if you consider say for example, the global withdrawal of water for agriculture industry and municipal use and then its total use uh, in liters say for example, the data from uh, 1900 to 1995 for about 95 years, you can see that um, uh, this uh, curve shows the total withdrawal and then you can see that this just uh, below this, this curve shows the agricultural withdrawal uh, and the municipal usage, usage is much smaller this white line shows the municipal usage and uh, then uh, this uh, gray line shows the industrial usage. But uh, especially in agriculture lot of water is uh, lost in uh, different ways. So, that way with respect to the total withdrawal you can see that the effective uh, wa water or the total water usage is much much less compared to the total withdrawal. So, that way if we can save uh, the water which we are uh, uh, using for agriculture uh, by uh, appropriate management practices, uh, optimal uh, irrigation management practices, we can save a lot of water and that can be utilized for many other purposes and then also we can uh, use say for, for example, for further irrigation uh, and other purposes. So, if you consider uh, a world average, the uh, world average for uh, irrigation is concerned, the irrigated area covers about 40 percent of arable lands in the world and the rainfall is uh, the rest that means about 60 percent of the uh, arable land uh, in the world is uh, say uh, the water is obtained through rain and only 40 percent is uh, obtained uh, through uh, irrigation. Say for example, now if you consider India's uh, agriculture scenario and irrigation is concerned. Uh, so, India has about um, 2 percent of uh, world's lands. 4 percent of fresh water, 16 percent of population and 10 percent of its cattle. So, this is uh, uh, the, uh, this is the major issue as far as a developing country like India is concerned. We have got only 2 percent of world lands, uh, but we have 16 percent of population and, uh, and then uh, 10 percent of uh, cattle and um, only hardly 4 percent of fresh water. And the geographic area is concerned uh, uh, say India has 329 million hectare of uh, area of which only 47 percent is cultivated, 23, 23 percent is, uh, is forested and 7 percent under non-agriculture usage and uh, about 23 percent of the land is wasteland. And uh, if you consider with respect to the population, the land availability is concerned per capita availability of land uh, 50 years ago. That means, in uh, about 1950s it was about 0.9 hectare, but now we are due to the population explosion. Uh, this will be reduced to about 0.14 hectare by 2050. So, that way the land availability compared to any other country it is much much smaller. So, that way India has a major problem uh, as far as the, the, the sustainable uh, practices as far as land, um, uh, water and uh, agriculture is concerned. So, whatever available we have to do it in a uh, better way. And out of the cultivated area in India uh, about 47, 40 percent is uh, irrigated which produces about 55 percent of the food requirement of the country and 60 percent is rain fed producing uh, uh, about 47, 45 percent of about 250 metric ton of food required presently. 
So, you can see that um, 40 percent of the irrigated uh, area produces 55 percent of the food and 60 percent of rain fed area only produces 45 percent of the, the 250 metric ton of food produced. So, in 40 years say for example, by 2050 uh, say uh, government of India wants to increase the irrigation level such, such that we can uh, have more food production. So, the irrigation uh, we, we want to you know, increase up to at least up to 50 percent. So, that 50 percent is um, irrigated area and 50 percent is uh, of the arable land is um, the rain fed area. So, that um, that ratio of food production 75 percent can be produced from irrigated land and 25 percent from the rain fed uh, land for out of the 500 metric ton of food required uh, by uh, 2050. So, this is the Indian scenario as far as the, the agriculture and uh, irrigation requirements uh, is concerned. So, now uh, let us see what are some of the uh, the agriculture related issues as far as um, especially India is concerned. So, um, uh, in India after the independence in 1947, uh, there is a, a, a large increase in agricultural growth rate. Say for example, in the 1950s if it was about 0.3 percent, 60s and 70s or 80s it has increased to 3.5 percent. Uh, so, this has mainly happened due to a large number of irrigation or um, reservoir projects implemented in the uh, earlier five year plans. So, that way the irrigation uh, capacity has increased and that way the uh, agricultural growth has increased. So, and then uh, another important issue is say, uh, say in the, uh, the first, first few five year plans say in 70s and 80s government of India uh, put a lot of efforts to uh, improve the agriculture sector through introduction of new high yielding uh, varieties uh, that is say we can call it as first green revolution in 70s and then in second green revolution say in 80s uh, uh, government of India through its um, uh, agriculture and uh, other ministries concentrate on the genetic engineering uh, through organized input management and uh, uh, say farmer services and extension and then also um, better seed varieties were Im implemented um, uh, in the agriculture sector. So, that way uh, we can call this um, um, say 1980s as second green re revolution. So, that way lot of improvement were taken place in the agriculture sector. But of course, lot of issues are still there uh, in the agriculture sector. So, some of the negative trends in spite of the positive trends as we discussed here, the negative trends are say per hectare yield is low. So, compared to other countries like uh, uh, USA and China, the per hectare yield is much low. Then infrastructure facilities uh, in the farming sector, is, uh, uh, sector are concerned are poor. Then uh, uh, say the uh, total management aspect is neglected in most of the farming sector. And then also uh, uh, you can see that uh, still uh, in rural area uh, the farming is not mechanized. So, people are using uh, different types of traditional um, um, equipments for farming and then uh, uh, say uh, most of the time the rural farmers are uh, not adopting scientific farming. Uh, so, that way uh, say lot of issues are there uh, as far as the agriculture uh, in India is concerned. So, uh, some of the uh, important constraint as far as agriculture uh, uh, sustainable agriculture in India are concerned uh, are listed here. So, these are uh, decline in per capita land availability. So, as we already discussed that per capita land availability is decreasing due to population explosion. Then stress in water resources. So, available water uh, is not sufficient for irrigation um, due to lack of um, uh, uh, say better agriculture management practices, water management practices or uh, lack of availability of sufficient water. Then degradation of soils, the lack of efficient water management. Uh, monocropping in many areas farmers are continuing with the same crop. So, that way uh, th there are lot of problems as far as nutrient management and then other uh, soil related issues are concerned. Then lack of crop management, um, negligence uh, of sustainable agriculture. So, um, say uh, as far as especially uh, most of the uh, uh, farmers are concerned they are not bothered about the sustainability issues as far as agriculture is concerned. And then of course, uh, people up the that means um, the uh, farmers are uh, indifferent to various uh, the scientific farming or mechanization 
and uh, other issues um, due to of course, uh, various other constraints um, uh, the, uh, due to lack of available resources or due to lack of uh, education uh, and uh, other issues. So, that way these are some of the important issues especially in a country like India as far as sustainable agricultural management practices uh, are concerned. So, now uh, let us see uh, the water the agriculture management practices uh, within the perspective of watershed. So, uh, the we have already seen that um, uh, agriculture practices are very important in, in any of the watershed management plans. So, uh, the agricultural practices uh, uh, following within a watershed uh, the 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 uh, whatever watershed plans or ma management issues we are making so that will definitely uh, affect so that way let us discuss about the watershed eco hydrology uh, and uh, agro ecosystems so this uh, agro ecosystems uh, we can define as a subset of ecosystems that defines functional uh, representation of coherent agricultural activity uh, including interaction of living and non living components involved uh, within the uh, watershed. So, we are considering a subset of the ecosystems as agro ecosystems. Uh, then uh, we can do various zonation uh, according to the, the ecology according to agriculture practices and the climate system. So, that way we can call these uh, zones as agro ecological zones uh, which are defined as uh, land units carved out of agroclimatic zones based on major climates superimposed on uh, length of uh, growing period. So, um, if it is a particular crop is concerned or particular uh, uh, say uh, 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 climate season is concerned. So, accordingly we can uh, uh, say uh, define this uh, agroecological zones. So, um, uh, this mainly depends up on the moisture availability. Say for example, India is concerned we can classify uh, uh, India into 20 agroecological regions and uh, 60 agroeco sub regions. So, uh, as we defined here agroecological zones uh, indicate um, uh, the various uh, uh, issues as far as the agriculture is concerned uh, with respect to land, with respect to climate and other issues. So, each agro eco sub region has uh, further been classified into eco unit at district level for developing long term uh, land use strategies. So, when we have discussed about the sustainable agriculture practices, this um, agro ecosystem or agro ecological zones uh, are very important since we can implement or we can sort out many issues uh, uh, by considering this uh, agro ecological uh, zones or uh, agro ecological uh, sub regions uh, as we discussed. So, here uh, in this slide uh, you can see the agro ecological regions of India. So, this uh, various colors indicate uh, various zones. So, these zones are delineated based on physiography, soil, uh, length of growing season and uh, bioclimate of the region. Say for example, uh, we can say uh, the agriculture ministry has put uh, various nomenclature also. So, for example, AER uh, zone means uh, say a zone is called AER zone. So, there the it is numbered as A13 uh, EH1, A stands for uh, physiography, 13 stands for soil scale, uh, EH stands for uh, bioclimatic zone and uh, 1 st stands for uh, length of growing period. So, that way we can put um, uh, various uh, agroecological um, uh, zones. Uh, so, AER zone A13 uh, EH1 is referred as western Himalayas. Uh, here. So, the some of the important characteristics of these zones shallow skeletal soils, uh, hyper arid climates with the uh, length of growing period less than uh, 60 days. So, that way uh, by, by considering this agroecological zones, uh, we can uh, look into various um, sustainable agricultural practices or issues and then we can go for uh, planning and management. It can be watershed based planning and management, but by considering this type of zones uh, we can implement uh, or we can have various plans. So, as we discussed, uh, so what are the necessities or what are the need of agroecological classification? So, the needs are listed here uh, to assess yield potentialities of different crops crop combination in agroecological regions or zones, then to formulate future plan of action involving crop diversification to disseminate uh, agricultural uh, research and uh, agro technology to other homogeneous areas, and then to determine the 
crop suitability for optimization of land use uh, in different agroecological regions or zones. So, as we discussed, uh, uh, so this agroecological region or zones uh, uh, say uh, indicates say what kind of crops uh, say what kind of climate uh, climatic region or what kind of um, soil pattern is there. Then uh, uh, we can put plants uh, say like what kind of crops can be grown there, what should be the crop uh, period length. So, like that various issue can be uh, put according to the agroecological classification or agroecological zones or regions and then we can come up with the plans as far as sustainable uh, agriculture practices are concerned. So, now uh, as far as uh, sustainable agriculture practices are concerned, uh, soil conservation and water conservations are two important uh, issues. So, let us uh, look into some of the important principles and uh, issues as far as soil and water conservation are concerned. So, soil conservation uh, important principles uh, are based upon uh, rainfall of uh, high intensity, then erosion uh, of top uh, fertile soil takes place. So, we have to stop this soil erosion. So, that is uh, uh, the so by various practices we can uh, reduce the soil erosion. So, that is the so called uh, soil conservation. So, we can have um, uh, various uh, measures like uh, condor farming and then uh, uh, say um, uh, we can plant trees or grass to reduce the soil conservation. So, various measures are po measures are possible like biological measures like a conservation tillage, deep tillage, conservation farming and we can go for mechanical measures and like a terracing, uh, water disposal, uh, other low cost measures. So, like uh, shown here we can uh, uh, say reduce the soil erosion and we can go for soil conservation uh, using uh, various uh, techniques. So, then as far as Water conservation is concerned, uh, the principle uh, of the water conservation is uh, uh, say where precipitation is less than crop requirements what, what we have to do. So, uh, then uh, where precipitation is equal to crop requirement or where precipitation is in excess of crop requirement requirements. So, accordingly uh, this three classes we can uh, have a particular um, say uh, intervention or particular uh, strategy uh, say according to the, the climatic or rainfall uh, conditions. So, uh, in the first case where precipitation is less than crop requirements, the strategy includes land treatment to increase runoff uh, onto crop areas uh, following water conservation use of drought tolerant crops uh, suitable managing practices. So, so this is when uh, the precipitation is less than crop requirement. Then uh, second case where precipitation is equal to crop requirement. So, the strategy is local conservation of precipitation, maximizing storage within the soil profile and storage of excess uh, runoff for subsequent use. So, this is uh, when precipitation is almost uh, equal to uh, uh, what is required as far as crop requirements are concerned. And then the third uh, case uh, where precipitation is in excess of crop requirements, the strategy is to reduce uh, rainfall erosion to drain surplus runoff and store uh, the surplus water for subsequent uh, use uh, in summer season. So, this way as far as uh, water conservation is concerned, we can uh, st make particular strategy depending upon the region, depending upon the case, uh, we can have either whenever precipitation is uh, less than crop requirement or whenever precipitation uh, is almost equal to uh, crop requirement or when precipitation is in excess of crop requirement. So, accordingly uh, we can go for particular strategy as far as uh, water conservation is concerned. So, now uh, based upon uh, these issues, now let us uh, discuss the sustainable land management practices. So, we have seen the for the, to achieve sustainable agriculture practices, um, we need to go for sustainable land management practices. So, uh, sustainable land management practices uh, me, uh, uh, that uh, gives um, uh, uh, knowledge based, it is a knowledge based system uh, uh, which helps to integrate land, water, biodiversity and environmental management to meet rising food and fiber demands while sustaining ecosystem services and livelihood to meet requirements for the growing population. So, we can uh, define the sustainable land management like this. So, it is a, a holistic way of sustainable approach as far as 
land, water, uh, biodiversity, environmental management uh, and then uh, say the requirement as far as the uh, growing population is concerned. So, this sustainable land management or SLM uh, enhances the productive capabilities of uh, land in crop and uh, grazed area. So, if you uh, consider the various issues appropriately and we can uh, increase uh, the productivity uh, the crop yield and then uh, forest forestry can be improved or uh, the, the grass land or gra grazed area can be improved. So, through sustainable land management uh, we can have actions to stop reverse degradation or at least to mitigate adverse effects of uh, earlier misuses. So, uh, whenever we discussed about the watershed deterioration issues and uh, related problems, uh, we have seen that um, uh, say here uh, say uh, the watershed will be de uh, degraded uh, say uh, by uh, various uh, problems, uh, various issues as we discussed earlier. So, uh, through sustainable land management practices, we can at least uh, uh, reduce what is happening and then also we can reverse the trend. So, that uh, uh, we can have uh, uh, say overall uh, sustainable uh, development. So, now uh, let us look into what are the objectives as far as sustainable land management practice are concerned. Some of the important objectives are listed here to increase land productivity. So, that means replenish soil nutrients uh, by liming or other means uh, and then uh, maintain soil cover. Uh, so, like uh, cover we can use cover crops and uh, residue recycling and uh, second objective is to provide adequate quantity of water. So, there is no scarcity of water. So, uh, we can use crop forage or tree species with uh, higher water use efficiency. So, that um, depending upon the uh, available water uh, we can uh, go for um, uh, say water resource management uh, using particular crop. Then to maintain water quality, so water quality is also an issue. So, uh, here uh, we can protect vegetative filter areas uh, in the riparian zones to remove excess sediment and nutrients and then also the non-point uh, source of pollutions all those we can reduce. And then uh, third objective is to reduce flooding and flood damage. So, as we discussed earlier flooding is always a, a problem. So, we can uh, through uh, sustainable agriculture management practices or sustainable land management practices, we can plant a deep rooted vegetation to uh, enhance infiltration and uh, water consumption by the plants and this also may decrease the soil erosion uh, problems. So, these are some of the important objectives as far as sustainable uh, land management practices are concerned. So, now uh, let us look into the sustainable agriculture issues. So, first one is the, the crop husbandry. So, uh, crop husbandry uh, means the practices of uh, growing and uh, harvesting crops uh, based upon scientific principles and careful management and conservation of uh, resources. So, uh, whenever uh, the, the, the cropping pattern, the, so we have to consider the cropping pattern, what type of crop is to be used, then uh, the various issues um, uh, say as far as um, soil is concerned, water is concerned and then um, uh, the, uh, the health of the crop is concerned. So, here the crop husbandry includes uh, soil enrich enrichment, usage of hybrid and improved seeds and uh, uh, better cropping pattern. So, uh, some of the techniques used for uh, improved crop productions uh, include uh, soil enrichment by biofertilization, uh, then introduction of micronutrient management, uh, then usage of hybrid seeds uh, achieving optimum uh, plant population so that uh, better production will be there, then timely and effective weed control. So, we, we say in uh, agricultural practices uh, weed control is very important. So, we have to timely uh, do the weed control then pest management. So, these are some of the uh, important techniques uh, which we can utilize uh, in crop husbandry. So, that um, we can achieve sustainable uh, agricultural uh, practices uh, as far as uh, various uh, crop management or crop uh, husbandry is uh, concerned. Then uh, the next issue in uh, uh, sustainable agriculture is nutrient management. Uh, so, as far as nutrient management is concerned, uh, it is important to tackle uh, problems uh, like uh, use of inorganic fertilizers, 
So, last few decades farmers are using a uh, lot of um, inorganic uh, fertilizers uh, like urea then uh, phosphates um, uh, like that. So, uh, whenever we use um, uh, with, uh, without um, uh, say optimal use or without uh, scientific um, uh, say knowledge then what happens is that uh, it uh, decrease the soil fertility and then also it become a pollution source as far as soil uh, and uh, water is concerned. So, then uh, other issues as far as uh, nutrient management is concerned to uh, stop uh, weed growth uh, to avoid crop diseases uh, improve crop yield. So, these are the, uh, the main uh, uh, issues as far as nutrient management is concerned. Uh, and then uh, as far as nutrient management is concerned uh, it includes uh, disseminate knowledge of nutrient and its function to plant growth. Uh, so, most of the time uh, say in a country like India the farmers uh, are not well educated. So, uh, we can disseminate the knowledge say why we have to study a nutrient analysis as far as particular area particular watershed is concerned and then how to improve the uh, nutrient um, uh, 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 say uh, in the soil. So, we can uh, disseminate the knowledge uh, uh, and uh, then uh, its function uh, say uh, in plant growth as far as nutrient management is concerned. Then assessment of uh, nutrient availability uh, as far as the watershed is concerned and then uh, nutrient management like uh, supply deficient nutrients to the soil also avoid excess use to protect the environment. So, as I, as I discussed um, say for example, uh, the nitrate phosphate uh, and then uh, 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 potash NPK is concerned. So, you can see that um, the last few decades um, many areas farmers are using this, um, uh, this uh, uh, the uh, important uh, nutrients like NPK. Uh, so, what happens when it is overuse is there it becomes uh, an environmental problems and whenever, whenever under, utilize, under use is there. So, then uh, it becomes a, a deficient nutrient as far as the particular area is concerned. So, that way we should uh, look into an effective nutrient management as far as the particular area or part particular uh, watershed is uh, concerned. Then uh, let us further look into the nutrient and its functions. So, uh, there are two basic types of nutrients one is so called um, macronutrients. So, these macronutrients are available in soil in large larger percentage say for example, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, sulfur, calcium, magnesium etcetera. Uh, so, then uh, other one is so called uh, micronutrients. So, this is available in soil in minute percentage. Uh, percentage. So, like um, uh, iron, uh, copper, zinc, mag uh, ma manganese uh, uh, etcetera. So, uh, that way uh, this uh, depending upon the requirement for the particular crop uh, uh, say depending upon the availability of that particular nutrient for the particular area uh, we have to uh, 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 provide that particular nutrients um, uh, to the soil. Uh, so, that the uh, crops can grow uh, in a healthy way and uh, it can give better yields. So, appropriate nutrient management is uh, very important. Then let us look into what are the important functions of nutrients. So, some of the important functions are listed here. Uh, these are uh, it include an involvement in uh, photosynthesis and uh, produ uh, produces uh, carbohydrates, then early root formation and growth. Uh, uh, then nutrient helps plants to survive in uh, bitter environmental uh, conditions like um, if the environmental conditions like um, uh, drought area or uh, the increased saline area. So, like that. Uh, so, the uh, nutrients can help plants to survive in this particular areas. Then increasing uh, water use efficiency. So, uh, if you give uh, appropriate uh, nutrients uh, appropriate levels to the plants or to the soil then um, we can even increase the water use efficiency and then important role in reproduction of uh, plants. So, these are some of the important functions as far as nutrient is concerned. So, we should have better nutrient uh, management plants as far as the particular area or particular uh, watershed is uh, concerned. 
so then uh, uh, say, we, say particular area is concerned we should assess the nutrient availability and then uh, we have to provide uh, nutrients to the soil for the particular crop is concerned. So, the various tests are possible as far as the assessment of nutrients are concerned. So, some of the important tests are listed here uh, like a traditional soil test uh, including uh, tests like P for pH, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium, uh, electric conductivity etcetera. So, this uh, type of test traditional soil test we can uh, perform uh, in every 3 to 5 years. So, that uh, depending upon the the, uh, the non availability of this particular uh, nutrients, we can provide this nutrients uh, according to the requirements. Then uh, another important test is so called nitrates, nitrate test. So, uh, this uh, include the pre planned nitrate test for additional nitrogen, uh, deep nitrate test how much nitrogen has already leached uh, below the crop rooting zone. So, this test we can do and then accordingly we can provide uh, appropriate um, say nitrate treatment as far as the soil is concerned. Then uh, next one is traditional plant test like a chlorophyll meter to quickly determine the nitrogen status without destroying any uh, plant tissues. Uh, then uh, also uh, we can go for irrigation water test and then uh, electric conductivity and pH test. So, these are some of the tests uh, used to, to assess the nutrients available for the particular area, particular uh, soil for particular cro crop growth. So, then accordingly uh, we can go for nutrient management by uh, supplying uh, appropriate nutrients on appropriate levels or appropriate measures uh, to particular area for the uh, uh, given uh, crop. So, now another important issue in uh, sustainable agriculture management is uh, uh, pest management. So, the pest management the main object objective is to uh, say how pest management interrelates with uh, climate, uh, water, crop and soil management uh, say uh, for farmers to understand. So, the farmers should understand how the, the pest management will help them. Then to incorporate uh, this um, pest management techniques um, uh, and its, uh, so its decision uh, making process as far as the farming is concerned. So, this is another important issue. So, some of the important necessities as far as pest management is concerned uh, uh, that include a critical component of uh, conservation practices. So, it is a very important the pest management, the negative impacts of pesticides. So, if overuse is there then a uh, lot of uh, issues uh, can be there. Uh, then uh, ground and surface water deterioration due to non point uh, source of um, uh, source of pollution like uh, pesticide contamination. So, this is a very important issue as far as water and soil is concerned. Then environmental risk uh, like um, uh, say for example, uh, burning crop residue for disease and then insect control. So, uh, these are the necessities as far as the pest management is concerned. So, then uh, for the considered area, considered uh, crop, we have to go for appropriate uh, pest management as far as the the sustainable agriculture management is concerned. Uh, then uh, generally we use a term called integrated uh, pest management uh, so, uh, IPM. So, uh, IPM approach is to, uh, to pest control that combines biological, uh, cultural and uh, other alternatives uh, to chemical uh, control with the judicious use of pesticides. So, uh, instead of uh, overuse or uh, underuse of pesticides, we have to judiciously use the pesticides by considering the uh, various biological, cultural and uh, uh, other chemical issues are concerned. So, the important goals of uh, integrated pest management uh, include uh, maximum use of naturally occurring control forces uh, in the pest uh, environment. So, particular uh, area or particular uh, crop is concerned, we have to consider whether uh, we can control the pest uh, naturally. So, if, if it is not possible only we have to go for uh, chemicals. Then first uh, focus on non-chemical measures 
so whether biologically or with uh, say natural control whether we can reduce the pest. So, first um, focus is on non chemical measures, then use of chemical pesticides only for preventing uh, severe damage. So, as far as particular uh, farm is concerned or particular agriculture is concerned. Um, so, we go for integrated pest management, uh, so that um, uh, to, to reduce of course, the uh, damages due to the pest, but um, we have to see that um, whether uh, without non chemical measures whether we can reduce the pest problem and uh, then if um, chemical measures to be adopted then it should be in a controlled way. So, that um, uh, there are very less environmental problems, so that we can achieve uh, sustainable agricultural management for the particular areas uh, concerned. So, now finally, let us look into uh, what are the important issues uh, as far as uh, sustainable agricultural management practices are concerned. So, some of the important issues are listed here. First one is uh, biomass management. So, for the particular area, uh, what kind of uh, crop is to be considered for the particular uh, region, particular area depending upon the soil, depending upon the water availability and also uh, like crop rotation. Uh, then uh, second uh, um, um, issue is concerned better conservation practices as far as land and water is concerned, uh, land and water are concerned we have to go for better conservation practices. Then uh, conservation buffers, so for a sustainable to achieve sustainable agricultural management we can uh, consider uh, conservation buffers like uh, forest uh, buffers uh, at particular area. Uh, then uh, grassed waterway, uh, then uh, we can go for a filter strip then uh, vegetative barriers and conservation barrier for wind etcetera. So, various conservation buffers we can consider for the particular watershed or particular areas concerned to uh, achieve sustainable agriculture management. Then as we discussed earlier, we can go for crop husbandry by considering the various crop management practices are concerned. Then uh, we can go for nutrient management. So, as we discussed in the previous slides, nutrient is very important. So, we should not overuse and we should provide sufficient nutrients as far as the particular area or particular crop is concerned. So, nutrient management is uh, very important in uh, sustainable agricultural practices. Then integrated pest management. So, uh, first we have to see whether we can go for pest control uh, without uh, chemical use and if uh, chemical use is required then we should go for a, uh, on a scientific way controlled way. Then of course, as far as sustainable agricultural practices are concerned uh, we can go for modern technology like uh, molecular biology uh, then and uh, genetic engineering. So, now uh, these two uh, branches of science like molecular biology and genetic engineering uh, have been grown um, considerably, considerably in the last few decades. So, uh, the, the expert, uh, expert uh, the, the uh, scientific uh, uh, say you, you availability of this uh, molecular biology and genetic engineering or its practices uh, through its practices we can have better sustainable agricultural management. We can go for uh, say for example, seeds are concerned we can go for hybrid and uh, improved seeds and then uh, we can go for tissue culture, we can go for um, uh, say um, uh, hybrid varieties. So, like that um, uh, various uh, things uh, various um, due to the development uh, in uh, molecular biology and genetic engineering we can uh, use the, the various available technique uh, techniques uh, for sustainable agricultural uh, or agriculture management uh, is concerned. So, now uh, another important issue in sustainable agriculture management is uh, uh, whether we can go for integrated uh, farming system. So, uh, uh, say integrated farming system or IFS uh, some of the issues are listed here in this slide. So, uh, say for example, mixed farming system uh, we can go for mixed farming system. So, mixed farming system combines crop and uh, livestock enterprises in a supplementary and or in or a uh, complementary manner. So, uh, for a particular watershed or particular areas concerned, uh, it is not only a crop uh, we can uh, have a uh, 
uh, integrated uh, way of uh, say uh, mixed farming uh, as far as um, crop is concerned uh, as far as um, livestock uh, uh, are concerned. So, we can uh, combine together so that we can have um, uh, better uh, um, uh, say economical achievements as far as the watershed is concerned. So, integrated farming system means integration of uh, various uh, agricultural uh, enterprises uh, like um, cropping, uh, animal husbandry, fisheries, uh, forestry, etcetera. Uh, so, uh, so that um, we can have um, uh, better economical achievements as far as the particular area is concerned uh, and uh, this gives uh, great potentialities uh, in the uh, agricultural economy. So, some of the important components of integrated farming system include uh, crops, livestock, birds uh, and trees. Uh, so, uh, depending upon the area say for example, crop uh, is concerned uh, uh, we can have monocrop that means only one type of crop or a mixed uh, uh, or intercrop and then multi uh, crops of uh, cereals, legumes uh, or pulses and oil seeds, forage etcetera. So, crop is concerned we can have not only monocropping we can uh, have um, different crops together say for example, uh, say uh, wherever coconut farming is there with the coconut uh, we can go for um, say we can grow pepper. So, like that um, uh, various crops can be combined uh, uh, with within the given area so that the farmers um, uh, can have um, uh, uh, more products and uh, uh, better benefits from their uh, particular farms. So, the main motto of integrated uh, farming system is uh, maximize food production and then overall development of a watershed. So, uh, say by integrated farming we can achieve uh, say uh, overall development of the area since the farmers will have uh, say better profits uh, since various through various crops in the same area. Uh, so, that um, we can maximize the uh, food production and maximize the benefits. Then integrated farming system is concerned some other uh, say issues like um, uh, intercropping, mixer cropping, strict crop cropping. So, as far as crops are concerned we can have um, uh, three ways of integrated farming. First one is intercropping. So, here crops are grown uh, in space available in between the plants say for example, turmeric can be grown in mangrove gardens. Uh, so, like that say uh, some crops will be already growing like this you can see that here the in the mango garden here mangoes are growing and then here other types of uh, crops. So, uh, this is so called uh, intercropping. Then second one is uh, mixer cropping. So, here um, uh, alternative rows of uh, different crops uh, we can uh, use. So, uh, so that um, um, say we can improve the crop yields then uh, preserve uh, soil fertility. Then the third one is strip cropping uh, where long strips are used for growing crops on leveled beds. So, like this as far as integrated farming is concerned cropping is concerned we can have uh, intercropping, uh, mixer cropping uh, and uh, strip, cro uh, strip cropping. So, like this um, uh, say uh, by using integrated farming system we can uh, achieve um, uh, sustainable um, uh, agriculture practices or sustainable agriculture management for the uh, given uh, watershed. So, um, within the uh, perspective of what we discussed today uh, sustainable agriculture management practices are concerned uh, let us look into a uh, case study. So, the case study is Adarsha watershed is in Kothapalli village uh, in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, it is spread over 465 hectares and uh, the uh, uh, say an integrated watershed management plan uh, based upon sustainable agriculture has been done by ICRISAT in this area. So, the details are taken by, uh, from the ICRISAT website, details are available in this website. So, the main objective of uh, this um, uh, watershed intervention uh, was to link strategic research in natural resource management with the development research to increase productivity uh, of rain fed agriculture through enhanced efficiency of natural resources while uh, maintaining the uh, resource base. So, this was the main objective as far as the uh, watershed intervention in Adarsha watershed. So, uh, finally, uh, through this uh, the aim was to increase um, the productivity through adoption of improved soil, water, nutrients and 
pest management as far as the area is concerned. So, the area is shown here it is taken from this uh, website. So, the uh, important uh, strategy in this watershed um, uh, was to link uh, the research with uh, watershed development schemes to enhance effectiveness of uh, community participation and in this watershed uh, a multidisciplinary multi institutional um, uh, consortium approach has been utilized uh, and various developmental uh, projects were implemented by research in this area. So, they used an islanding approach uh, through micro watershed as upfront demonstrations uh, managed by farmers with uh, technical uh, backups. So, uh, technical uh, advice uh, given by uh, ICRISAT in this area and then uh, uh, say the farmers implemented these pr projects. Uh, then uh, the, uh, the, the watershed is concerned on farm uh, strategic research was conducted by ICRISAT in partnership uh, with the farmers. So, some of the important watershed details are uh, say 270 farmers out of which uh, uh, in this area 136 are small uh, land holding uh, up to 1 hectare and 60 are medium land holding and um, 74 large land holding about 2 hectares. Uh, so, this were as far as the distribution of land holding as far as farmers are concerned in the other watershed. Then uh, some of the other watershed details like annual uh, rainfall is about um, 800 mm uh, uh, say 85 percent of it occurs during June October. So, soils are predominantly uh, black soils in this area, soil depth varies from 30 to 90 centimeter. Uh, the general slope of the land is about th 3 percent and some of the important crops grown include uh, sorghum, maize, cotton, sunflower, pigeon pea, soya bean in rainy season and sorghum, uh, uh, sunflower vegetables in post rainy season under rain fed condition. And then in some areas um, uh, say the, the farmers grow turmeric, onion and rice cultivation depending upon the uh, water availability and then uh, well irrigation. So, all these uh, details were taken from the CRISAT uh, website. So, uh, let us look, uh, look into what are the important uh, interventions uh, done by the, uh, the CRISAT authorities. So, here uh, uh, they, they uh, conducted a uh, complete uh, resource mapping as a first step and then uh, they identified uh, the various problems as far as the watershed is concerned. They discussed um, the various issues with the farmers. So, um, uh, some of the interventions done by CRISAT include continuous weather monitoring. Uh, they implemented a number of uh, automatic weather stations in the regions and then uh, 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 say conducted scientific soil analysis. So, that um, soil according to the uh, soil analysis, it, the soil has been classified uh, and then uh, uh, they identified um, which uh, type of soil is suitable for particular crops. Then uh, also a cropping system analysis has been carried out. So, that um, how much crop yield is possible, then uh, what is the cost for farming and then what will be the uh, benefits from the particular uh, crop in, in the particular area. Then uh, cropping has been uh, done according to soil, uh, then uh, the cost effectiveness of particular cropping has been also analyzed. So, that um, uh, whether uh, say better crop yield can be achieved through various measures. Then another uh, aspect which has been implemented in this watershed is intercropping. So, we have already seen what is intercropping, it is not only one crop, various crops were uh, say run in the same area. Then use of nitrate fixing plants, so that um, uh, so instead of providing uh, say nitrogen through artificial fertilizers, so nat if the nitrogen fixing plants um, give um, nitrogen to the soil. So, uh, this has been implemented, then vermicomposting, then organic farming. So, all those uh, things were done in this particular watershed. So, also integrated uh, pest control uh, through natural control measures were implemented uh, in this watershed. So, that was uh, one, one another important aspect of uh, the success in this um, uh, watershed. So, then uh, finally, the um, CRISAT or the NGOs 
uh, uh, carried out capacity building and then uh, they gave a training to farmers so that uh, farmers know what kind of uh, uh, cropping to be done and what particular area and then uh, say scientific way of uh, farming and then um, by using soil testing and then and then you know, nutrient management then uh, indicated pest management so these are some of the important uh, watershed interventions done in this watershed so that now let us look uh, what are the important impacts of these uh, measures interventions and done by the uh, the ecrisat in this adarsha watershed so uh, the analysis showed that um, crop yield uh, considerably improved in many of the areas then considerable improvement in water availability including ground water so they implemented rainwater harvesting also in this area so that improved the water availability for the area then integrated nutrient and pest management uh, were carried out. So, that way farmers are using um, very less artificial uh, fertilizers, uh, uh, but um, they go for organic fertilizers and then uh, better nutrient management and then they go for uh, better uh, say uh, scientific pest control uh, and um, natural pest control um, instead of going for uh, say chemical uh, 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 using pe chemicals for pest management. Then continuous monitoring, so as far as the watershed is concerned um, it was monitored using remote sensing and then GIS platform has been also used for uh, be overall better management. Then holistic watershed management, uh, the holistic approach as far as land, water, agriculture and uh, people are concerned. So, that way a holistic development approach uh, has been uh, um, say um, done in this particular watershed. Then uh, this watershed has been declared as a role model of integrated sustainable watershed management through sustainable agriculture management by various agencies and then uh, uh, so this has been replicated in uh, many uh, villages in India and abroad. So, another important aspect in this watershed is capacity building and training has been given by the NGOs uh, to the people. Uh, so, people participation was another important aspect and then overall so socio-economic upliftment has been taken place uh, in this watershed through uh, various interventions. Uh, so, as far as this today's lecture is concerned some of the important uh, reference are listed here including uh, various uh, websites. Then uh, based upon today's lecture uh, here I have listed uh, one tutorial question. So, the question is illustrates necessity of sustainable agriculture management uh, practices as far as overall watershed management plans are concerned. So, uh, you can do uh, through a systematic approach some of the steps are mentioned here. So, identify the components then uh, uh, the, the possible scientific interventions as far as the uh, agriculture management practice concerns and identify the problems and identify the role of uh, uh, modern techniques like molecular biology and genetic engineering. Uh, then uh, importance of uh, nutrient management and then role of integrated pest management. So, uh, most of these issues uh, we have discussed in the lecture. Then uh, some of the self evaluation questions uh, from today's lectures lecture are listed here. Uh, first one is discuss agriculture water use and compare uh, world and Indian scenarios. Uh, second question is what are the major constraints in achieving uh, watershed based uh, sustainable agriculture uh, management. Then uh, discuss the uh, agroecological classifications in India and its importance. Then illustrate sustainable land management practices. So, uh, for most of these questions uh, the details are available uh, in today's lecture. Then a few assignment questions discuss Indian agriculture and irrigation scenarios, then uh, explain watershed ecology and agro systems, then uh, explain important uh, issues in soil and water conservation, then discuss uh, importance of nutrient and integrated pest management and related issues. So, um, most of these questions uh, can be answered uh, based on uh, today's lecture. So, finally, one unsolved uh, problem is uh, listed here for your watershed area study the scope for integrated uh, farming systems in your area. So, this uh, we can do in a step by step procedure. So, first you can identify the suitable uh, integrated farming system practices for the area for integrated uh, sustainable agriculture management. 
uh, then uh, carry out uh, stakeholder analysis, uh, consider traditional practices uh, of the farmers, uh, you can go to the field and discuss with the farmers and identify, then suggest scientific methods, uh, various methodologies how we can go for uh, integrated farming systems, then identify soil and water conservation measures for the area, then identify proper monitoring and evaluation strategies for the area and uh, involve how we can involve the local people uh, to achieve integrated farming systems for the uh, given watershed. So, this is uh, you can do it, it as an unsolved uh, problem. So, this is uh, uh, today's lecture we discussed about the uh, sustainable agricultural um, management practices and then it is important uh, importance in watershed management. Uh, so, we will discuss further the variable various issues as far as uh, sustainable water management or sustainable watershed management issues are concerned in the uh, next lecture. Thank you.